So I'm going to switch gear here. So you will hear that actually this is a, a somewhat different flavor than Sri Ram's talk. Like uh, he did an excellent talk, so I, I learned a lot from you know sitting in second half of the talk. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk about alignment-free RNA-seq analysis. Um, if you have done RNA-seq analysis, uh, you probably would notice that in the past uh, couple of years, uh, people start to do uh, alignment-free analysis, right? In the before that, it was always like you have to do the alignment first, and uh, and based on the uh, the quality of the alignment, you can do any subsequent analysis, like in for the you know isoform expression or doing differential expression analysis and uh, anything you would like, right? But the first step was the alignment, and um, so um, since I'm a computer scientist, so don't. Uh, uh, call me if I say something wrong about biology. So I'm just saying that this is a very high level, 10,000 feet picture. Like you take some samples and then take the uh, uh, the material, the genetic material that you want to do the uh, high throughput sequencing, and it could be you know nowadays it's a whole family of things that you could do, right? So and. Uh, and then if you look at the process, typically they, they fragment, right? They, they shred it that like into short reads, right? And then the data you get is really a bag of a collection of reads. We're not talking about uh, hundreds, thousands, or you know, tens of thousands. We're ta talking about like how many millions of reads per sample, right? So that's a, the, uh, the scale of the data we are, we're dealing with. And nowadays, for large study, uh, we typically not just looking at one or two samples, and uh, we we perhaps have hundreds of thousands of samples, and sometimes we track the longitudinal uh, data for uh, for for example for the subject, so that it will be multiple time points you collect, for example, RNA seq data, right? Depend on your budget, I should say. Um, then. Um, Collectively, you can see, I um, apologize if you can't see, because I, I steal this picture from the um, NCBI website. And uh, you can see the growth of the, the, the amount of data, sequencing data available. And uh, certainly, it, uh, uh, you can see that it's very clear that uh, we'll have more data than we ever had before. right? And uh, one way to, uh, uh, to Handle this was that well maybe computer getting faster be uh, than before too but uh, uh, the reality is actually the amount of data the, the growth of the data is actually way succeed the uh, uh, surpass the um, the actually the hardware advances so we have to do something uh, to think about the algorithm to think about the model so that we can manage all the computation so today I'm going to focus on RNA-seq but. Uh, um, the concept and the idea can, can also apply to analyzing other type of uh, sequencing data. So for assume that we want to do isoform expression estimation, OK? And this is the standard process, the traditional process. You, you take your read, you first align to for either your genome or your transcriptome. And then once you have this aligned form, and then you, from that, it typically is uh, um, uh, you, you set up a linear system, you do the inference, right, through an EM algorithm. Um, that's very typical. And in the middle part of this alignment actually would take um, majority of the time. And uh, I should have, a, well, maybe I, I include the, uh, not, not the best figure, uh, the table here, but uh, um, we test uh, three standard pipeline. And then this is just for one sample, OK? One sample of RNA on mice, and uh, you can see how many uh, CPU time. And uh, you know, so I know you guys are really good in math, so probably you can convert that to number of hours or number of days. So the first one probably 19 to 20 hours, right? If you if you do the calculation, and then you can see after that could be like a day or so or something. This is one sample, and um, and if you measure the per a step, a component, actually the alignment taking about 80 to 90 percent of the, the entire process. Okay, so that will be the computational bottleneck that uh, uh, we need to address. And, um, and if you look at nowadays the current version of those alignment algorithm, they're getting better and faster, but still um, that's not 
fast enough, right? We would really like to um, uh, accelerate that. And uh, so in the traditional um, algorithm, so we do the alignment back to the uh, original transcript or genome. It takes hours to days to finish uh, because we have a, in that particular data set, we have uh, like about 50 million reads. Uh, it's all 100 base pair long reads and parent reads. So, so what, uh, what you do here is that uh, this is a cartoon that what showing you what happened. So here, for each bar is a, is a read. Okay, assume that we do the alignment and then somehow distribute it for this uh, short region, right? Like so. Okay, so that was uh, the, the end, the outcome of the alignment. And then what it's essentially do when you do the estimation of the abundance, what you do is that uh, with all this algorithm, despite all this difference, and then they, they try to estimate the area under this curve in some way. And then put in, including some normalization factors to take into account maybe the lens, the uh, what other confounding factors that you may have, okay? So, but the idea is that they, they want to integrate the, uh, the area of this curve, okay? So, and then you name it, that's true for all the uh, popular algorithm after the alignment, right? Like cufflinks, uh, RSEM, Express. So, so the, uh, and because even though this, this second step is not the most time consuming step, but it's required the first step of the alignment, right? Because it takes the input, it's really the BAM file that actually then they can uh, estimate, do the estimate. And of course, there's some difficulty, like there's uh, something called multi-read, which is a read that can be aligned to multiple locations, and how do you uh, assign it to one location, right? How do you distribute that? And uh, that's why typically it's set up as a linear system. You learn that. You distribute in a way that make most of them as consistent as possible, okay? Most of the, uh, the transcript. So, so let's see why speed is important here, right? Because uh, as I said that typically we don't just, uh, just do the, for example, ISO, ISO form expression uh, estimation. Typically that's just uh, one step out of a, a big analytics pipeline. And sometimes we don't know what should be the best, the optimal parameter to set because each of those uh, uh, algorithms, right, they, they, they have, you have to set a number of parameters, right? You have to know what should be the right setting. And, uh, and then guess what, and then when you start to tune your algorithm and then you, you, you change the parameter, adjust the parameter, you have to run it again, again, again. That's very time consuming. And uh, once you finish one experiment and then once you have another collection of uh, uh, data, then you do not necessarily you know, know what would be the best parameter for the next batch. Right, because that could change. So basically, um, it's not what we talk about the hours or days. It's not the, you know, we just run it once and then we done with it. We typically run it many, many, many times before we're happy, feel comfortable with the outcome. That's very typical. So that's why we, we want to, uh, we see that, well, we should speed it up. So, but can we, right? And uh, as I said that, uh, all those algorithm alignment uh, based algorithms, they basically the second step, they just uh, uh, estimate the area under this curve. And the, now the question is that, can we do that estimation without the alignment, right? If we can do that, great. Then we don't need to um, really do the alignment. And uh, the approach that's been used so far is based on KMERS, right? KMERS is a concept that everybody who learn Bioinformatics is probably most familiar with, right? Because it's been used in many places for a long time. So what's a KMER? KMER is just a short sequence of lens K. Okay, we call that KMER. And, uh, and we use that, well, if you're coming from like data mining or machine learning field, a uh, concept called feature, right? So that's uh, very commonly used. And um, so we basically take the KMERs. And we, instead of doing the alignment, we count the camera occurrence in the read directly. And use those counts 
we don't just count one camera, we count many, many cameras, right? We don't just use the, uh, the uh, we use the count, and then if we can use that to enforce the isoform expression accurately, or I should say as accurate as before, then we should be good, right? We don't need the alignment. Why do I say as accurate as before? Because when you test, if you can simulate the data, generate a synthetic data and the, the read, and then you simulate read, and then you run any of this algorithm, uh, as long as if you inject some, some kind of sequencing error simulated, right, or noise or something, a bias, you would not expect to get 100% accurate, no matter which algorithm you use. That's just the reality, right? And it depends on how noisy and how much error is in, you, you put in, you, you could see that the, uh, the accuracy would range from 80 some percentage to 90 some percentage, right? I haven't seen a case actually uh, give you 100% accuracy. So typically, if people say, well, it's 90% uh, or above, then, then people actually are very happy of that. Because in reality, for some of the data we, we, are, we, we have been using, actually, the, um, uh, the, the accuracy is quite low. And in the sense that when we do the, if we did the first step, the alignment step, you will see that actually a very high percentage, up to maybe 20, 30 percent of the read won't be able to, to, uh, to even align. So, of course, all those reads won't go into the next step of the uh, estimation, right? If you, if you need to use alignment. But for use alignment free method, uh, there's still um, a hope, right? Because based on maybe some of the camera you will not be recognized, but some other camera in that read, maybe you can recognize so that you can rescue some of the information that would be lost otherwise. So, so if we can do this well, we won't be able to, uh, won't, don't need the alignment. So the challenge here is that uh, we all know that um, uh, multiple transcripts, this can happen actually all over the place, right? So, uh, may have some common subsequence shared. They could be like they are maybe from the same gene or family, gene family, or maybe they're par from parallax genes. So, so there's a number of reasons that they are shared. So what, what that would uh, you know, introduce? So what kind of difficulty that would introduce? It's because uh, f that's, mean, that, that's why that's one of the reasons that actually the, some of the, the reads, right? can be, if you do the alignment, can align to multiple places. That's one of the reasons, right? There's nothing wrong with the alignment algorithm because if you really compare the, uh, the reference you aligned against and uh, with, with the read, they do align, right? So, and uh, then currently what people do is that we, I will talk about is a set of a system using the EM algorithm to do the, to do the inference. So let's uh, look at the example. So we, we start to use k-mers and then assume that I only have five transcripts, okay? And then we want to collect for a given k, we have to determine k ahead of time. And um, for a given k, typically it's somewhere between 30 to 50, 60, depend on your read length, depend on which species you're using, and the uh, also depend on how much error you expect or mismatch between your reads and uh, your reference you expect. Okay, and uh, so basically, just uh, you know, think of uh, you're doing a sliding window of length k, and then you generate all the k-mers, right? And for the first transcript, you get uh, let's see, those are the list. Okay, and then you do that for every one of them, and you can see some of them may be shared by multiple. That's okay, right? Then you just take the collection, okay? And then this is what uh, uh, algorithm Selfish is doing, right? They generate the, what they call transcript k-mers, okay? Transcript k-mers, and then they build index because you can see that one transcript contain multiple k-mers, right? That's a collection of k-mers. And one k-mer may appear in more than one transcript. So this is a many-to-many -many relationship. And then they index this two-way mapping through the, uh, 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 through some index. And also they, that's the first step, right? They create all the index, okay? And then also they use uh, uh, hashing, uh, like a minimum perfect hash, hash to, so, that, so that they can map 
the transcript came to a unique number in the contiguous region, okay, without any collision. So that, that's all just algorithm uh, uh, optimization that uh, actually you know, speed up the, the process. Because once you have that list of k-mers, what you need to do is to go to the, the collection of the raw read without alignment to literally just count how many read, you know, contain each of the k in your list, right? So there, there's a, so that's why all this index they build in the first phase will be used to facilitate that count, okay? So you need to know which camera occurs in which reads, right? And then you need to really increment counters. And then after they do that, they just use the camera count directly to do all the inference, okay? In a way quite similar to the previous, previous all this approach, like which based on the alignment, okay? So uh, this is just their algorithm design, like uh, how they speed up things. So this is uh, basically a perfect hashing uh, transcript, uh, transcript index, and that's what they call it. And then they basically map the K, uh, each, uh, all the k-mers to a range from zero, zero to d minus one. D will be the number of uh, uh, k-mers. So basically, we imagine that each of them uniquely map to a number. So that helps them to track things, to uh, locate the right counter, to, you know, that's just the algorithm speed up, okay? And you can see that on the algorithm, this step, right, and then can be um, easily parallelized, right? You, you don't need to do one read at a time, right? You can, you can basically, uh, doing many things in parallel as, you know, you can farm out multiple, many, many threads and then do all this uh, counting, okay? And uh, after that, they, um, they, they collect the count and then, and then they will, as you can see that one camera maybe may, sh may appear in multiple transcript, right? Then, and then, so the read is also Appear, may appear in, mod, well, may match multiple transcript, right? Because they align well, they contain the camera that are shared, right? That's possible. And then, then uh, what they do, they basically using, I'm not going to go to the detail, but uh, they uh, basically, they want to distribute the camera count uh, properly so that uh, um, is a, in a way similar to like cufflinks or, uh, RSM or some like that. So basically, they set up a linear system, okay? And then they, they, they learn that what should be the best way. I'm going to, uh, I think in a few slides down the road, I'm going to show you how, the, how these things works. So, and uh, before they do the inference, and uh, what they do is that they want to, uh, in order to further speed up the inference, uh, they try to collapse uh, the uh, redundant, inf what they call redundant in information. What that means is that uh, they could see that actually two k-mers, right, almost appear in always in the same collection of uh, transcript, right? You can see their count and then uh, almost the same, right? So you can see, you, if you think about, I have a k-mer and another k-mer just uh, differ by, by, by one position, right? And uh, these two are very likely to occur, you know, in the, in the same place, right? So you could observe that actually their, uh, their count are very much uh, correlated, right? So they first identify that they somehow just uh, group them together, okay? And they don't treat them as a separate camers. In this way that they reduce the number of uh, camer, effective camer that they will go into the next step. Because the next step, they will set up a big linear system, right? Because the unknown variable they want to infer would be the uh, uh, expression level of each uh, the uh, transcript, right? That's what they want to infer, and uh, and then the so in that way uh, before before that they want to really minimize uh, really the number of uh, variables that contribute to that. So this is the uh, EM algorithm. So basically. Uh, it's going through iterations, right? And then, and then, so basically, the you know the iteration would be that first they, based on the 
the initial steps, they do the initial assignment, right? At the beginning, they don't know uh, where it belongs to, then they would be equal probability to be assigned to each of them, right? After that step, then they do the, um, the, um, the M steps. So basically, based on the initial assignment, right, they would have an initial estimate of the, the, uh, the expression level of each of the transcript, right? And based on that, then they go back to say, well, since uh, not every transcript are equally expressed, I'm going to use that to adjust my assignment, right? It's no longer equal probability. And then since this changes, then I go here, then I, I recalculate what should be the transcript. And then you can see that I do this iteration until everything converge, OK? So that's, these steps, um, it's very similar to like, you know, any of the, uh, the inference algorithm uh, that when people use uh, the alignment-based method. So basically, there's minor changes you have to do. Uh, now we, we use the count, uh, the, the read count of the k-mers instead of uh, the, uh, the alignment to the, uh, uh, to the uh, reference. Okay, because before they used the number of read aligned to, to each of the region, but now we, we change that to uh, the, uh, the k-mers and also the, uh, the number of read contain each k-mers. So that's the only change, but the, the big framework still remains the same. Okay, so after that, typically people either uh, infer like something called TBM or RPKM. So these are all standard. So if you look at all the algorithm, pretty much the same, okay? So they, they, that's what the output of that. So I'm not going to go into the detail. So if you do the side-by-side -side comparison, so you can see that with the standard algorithm, and uh, so instead of a line read to the transcript, then, well, at the very first step, they build a different index to support subsequent analysis, right? And then, and then the, once, uh, like you using Borel transformation and to index uh, the genome, right? And then so that you can align very fast, uh, align your read very fast, and the other one you build the camera index, uh, so that you can count it very fast. And then we, instead of aligning the read to transcript, then you just count camera in the read. Instead of uh, just uh, you know doing the inference, allocate redistribute the read, and then you really redistribute the camera in this case. And then then. The last step, once you have that, the, the last step estimation of the abundance is very similar. So if you look at the paper, uh, it turned out to be that without doing the alignment, the, uh, the accuracy, the estimation accuracy is comparable. It's about the same, okay, as uh, if you did the, uh, the alignment. Okay, in our study, actually the alignment, all the alignment-free algorithms on, on simulated data, uh, do slightly better in accuracy than the alignment based. Well, it's, a, it's marginally better, so that no one sort of want to claim that it's really depend on the data you use, right? But uh, it's, a, it's a better, it's never worse, okay? So you can safely use that. If you trust the previous algorithm uh, that use alignment, you should trust the alignment free algorithm because uh, uh, we haven't found in any case that it, it does worse. But in terms of the time, the, the running time, uh, it's much, much faster. Nowadays, instead of talking about hours or days, we're talking about minutes, okay? We're always arguing like, uh, should we do 10 minutes or one minute or less than one minute? So, so you can see that the, the skill is different, right? How we measure the, uh, the time. So that's uh, the amount of uh, the speed up. So now the second question we have, well, that's all great. And then the question we have is, uh, do we need all transcript cameras, right? And uh, then in Selfish, they start with all transcript cameras. They see, uh, well, at least uh, it's up here one, in, in one transcript, I'm going to count it. Because I, I'm afraid that if I don't do that, I won't be able to do uh, accurate uh, estimation. So, but uh, as I mentioned before, we know that all those adjacent cameras, right? In, uh, in transcript or, or in transcripts with uh, even in different transcripts but uh, having some common subsequence. They are likely in the same equivalent class, means that they really don't give you extra information, right? They are more or less give you redundant information. And then, and then that's even recognized in, in selfish. That's why before they do the inference, they somehow try to 
uh, clap them together, right? All those cameras together. But now the question is, well, but they still do the counting and everything, uh, doing the index. So now the question is, uh, maybe if we can identify that earlier, we don't need to do this, you know, all this counting index, right? Because we're not going to use that anyway later, right? So, so, so the idea here is that, well, why don't we cluster doing cluster based on sequence similarity of all the transcript, right? The known transcript. And first, so that can help us maybe to identify a subset of cameras that are, are, are actually equally powerful as the full collection of all cameras. So to distinguish the term, we call that sigma. It's a, a camera that's being selected. So we define that we, we cluster the, the transcript based on uh, sequence similarity, uh, assuming that for the first uh, five transcripts, like I showed you before, then we, we have somehow grouped them into two clusters. And for each of the two clusters, we want to identify cameras that only appear in that cluster, but no, not other clusters. Okay? It's unique to that cluster. So why do we want that? Because if we read really contain that camera, we know that that's come from transcript in that cluster. Okay? The reason we do it by cluster rather than individual transcript is because some transcripts does have, uh, do have a very high sequence similarity, right? Because uh, they're from the same gene, and in order to accurate them, uh, estimate, them, estimate them accurately, we do need, you know, cameras shared by multiple transcripts. We cannot completely avoid that, right? I wish we could, then that would be, the inference is going to be uh, very easy, but uh, unfortunately we have to use cameras that shared by multiple transcript, but we want to minimize that as much as possible if, uh, if there's a way to do it. So let's see, those are the cameras I highlighted that only show appear in one cluster. And we take those, and uh, then we go to the reads, and then we basically count those cameras. That's the idea. Okay? And then, um, so, and then after we count, and then we only use those, uh, those sigma count in the, in the subsequent uh, inference. So, and then this would be equivalent like uh, some kind of a sampling process that y if you want to consider. So that, uh, because we only select uh, a very small percentage of cameras. It, it turned out to be that the, the number of cameras satisfy that cr criteria I, I laid out uh, is uh, quite big. And, uh, but we don't need all of them. In the end, we we'll only use 5% of the cameras. And then that can do equally well. So, and, uh, so now we, we only look at the cameras and uh, the, those sigmas we selected. And we don't want to, uh, we don't need to use the rest of the reads. And then again, the problem is to do the, uh, to estimate the unknown abundance for a level of, of each transcript. And then, um, then again, that's a maximum likelihood estimation, as I mentioned before. You set up this linear system to do it, and then you use the camera, uh, sigma count. And um, so this is uh, comparing to the, uh, um, uh, the alignment-based algorithm. That's, that's a similarity. And then one big difference uh, uh, with um, this approach compared to uh, this called RN scheme uh, compared to Selfish is that Selfish set up a, a one big problem. The, the maximum likelihood estimation is, uh, is the one big system. Okay, they do that one estimation. But after you cluster the the, uh, the transcript, right, and then you only select the uh, uh, the cameras that only appear in one cluster. So what that mean that um, there's no sharing between those cameras you used. Then you effectively can dec uh, partition your one big system into many smaller systems. Then you can do the inference in parallel because there's no interference between them. Okay? So that can help you to sp further speed up the system. So again, the pipeline that the whole process of uh, and first do clustering, find the uh, uh, sigmas, and then this would uh, uh, be the clustering look like. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see some of them are big clusters, as you could imagine, right? So some of them, like transcript, have a lot of overlap, um, shared uh, subsequence. Some of them are smaller, right? They're not equal in size, OK? The big one in the middle is, is actually quite big. <laughs> um, so, and then 
and you, you, you do the count, counting, and then you do the, the inference. So uh, the first optimization here is to, uh, to find all the, all the sigmas after the clustering. And then the, the reason is that we do that is that and we can always like initiate one counter in the, in the memory and then, then do just the, the, the counting. But then that will take about 50 gig memory, and then which means it's way beyond my laptop. And uh, in order to do that, we, we don't uh, have a specific counter. We use Bloom filter to do that. And then it would you know, reduce that to 100 megabytes. That's just some detail. It's a probabilistic data structure to quickly tell you whether an element is in a set or not. OK. So, because we need to know whether cameras show up in other transcripts or not, whether cameras show up in, in this class or not other clusters. So, so what, we need to do a lot of those checks, right? So Bloom filter, actually we use a collection of Bloom filter to facilitate those checks. Okay. So the second one is that once you determine the set of sigma you use, you need to go to the read to count. And um, that's this step, and that would be and you can do the brute force way, which is have complexity of k times n, and uh, n is a linear length of all your reads. Um, but then we uh, we just uh, using a small trick, uh, the, the rolling hash to uh, reduce the complexity to n. So the idea is basically the hashing function is that you can recompute your update your hashing function in, in constant time once you do a sliding window over this. So because you reuse uh, this middle part. Okay. Um, after that, that's the inference, and the, the inference will be the similar as before. But uh, the only difference is that you set up uh, not just one big one, but many, many, a few thousand small ones. So, and uh, so you can see that this one you can see that actually by measured by Pearson correlation or rank correlation, um, this. Uh, they are quite similar to the result measured by on the same set of data. These are real data by microarray. That's why I mean that they are comparable results. They're, they're as good as, uh, as before, as accurate as before. And, uh, but uh, you, you can see that they're very close. All, all as long, I think as long as the data is in reasonably good quality, and uh, there, are, there are some minor difference in the result by different algorithm. But by and large, they're very highly correlated. Okay, they're highly similar. And then, but if you look at the running time, and then they would cut down to further, right? So it basically takes uh, 10 minutes. I mean, this is an old number, but right now it takes less than 10 minutes. And um, so what we have learned is that so far is that uh, um, KMER-based uh, uh, quantification is able to uh, achieve high quality, right? And, uh, and uh, we don't need to use all the KMERs that appear in the transcript. Only a small subset would do the work. And, uh, and then, but so far, once we somehow uh, reduce that down to the camera, we don't really look at the uh, relationship between the camera, right? We talk about, oh, if they are overlap like this, then they're highly likely they're giving the same information. And then, but that's the only thing we actually, because of that, we, we remove one of them, right? So, but then, um, we don't really use other information other than that to help us to the inference. But if we do, maybe we can get things done even faster and better, right? So, so the idea here is that, especially in dealing with uh, the, uh, th those multi-reads, right? And if you, you can connect the upstream and downstream reads, right, or cameras that help you to do the inference, actually that can make uh, the uh, estimation much easier, much faster. So that's uh, the, the Callisto idea. So uh, they want to combine KMER in a way so that they can uh, main, uh, basically not just maintain, but also in, in slightly improve the accuracy. And you can see in, the, in this example, you can see that uh, between transcript A and B, there are some shared uh, sequence. And then, of course, once you convert that to read, that means many I mean, things in, the, in blue that are in common, right? And if you read, uh, read a line to those set of cameras or contain those set of cameras, there's this uh, multi-read, I mean, it's ambiguous which one it belongs to, right? 
But then, in order to do that, I mean, to really do the inference, right? And then they want to be able to connect the blue part to the before and after, the, uh, the red and the purple. To do that, um, they first build the index out of the transcript, OK? Con con construct a deburn graph uh, on, the, on the transcript. And then this would be a, a cartoon of the deburn graph. And then you can see all the shared elements are being properly connected. OK? And each of the circle is, uh, is a k-mer, let's say. OK? And uh, the de Bruyne graph is constructed. You can see the de Bruyne graph is essentially constructed uh, based on the overlapping k-mers, right? So, and out of the, uh, the transcript. So then this, that's their index. The second step is that once you have a read, right, they, they want to they call it the pseudo alignment to this de Bruyne graph. Okay, to see where it is. And to speed this up, and then they want to be able to jump ahead. They don't need to do, go one by one, do the alignment, because they know that if I have a, that one, this one, then it's a, very likely I have those two. Okay, and then I can directly jump ahead to check what's next, okay? So that's their algorithm. And then that can speed up things. And, uh, and then after they did that, um, again, similar EM algorithm to do the inference, OK, after they finish the count. OK, so you can see that in their de Bruyne graph, the k-mers associated with uh, the de Bruyne graph, right? They know the, what are the connection between other k-mers and this particular one that can help them to, to do the counting. In the end, they still use a k-mer count to do the inference, okay? So this is clipped from their paper of their result. You can see that uh, it's uh, much faster than most of the other algorithm. Sorry, this is a much, uh, this shows that actually is a, um, more accurate than most of other algorithm, except one, OK? And, uh, and uh, then, in terms of the speed, it's, um, it's much faster, OK? And um, so that's, th that's what's from the paper, the result from the paper, OK? And if you do use your own data set, you do the uh, um, comparison. Those are the actually three algorithm, uh, selfish iron scheme, and Calisto, the, the, and then from the uh, um, selfish, then there's a faster algorithm called Selman, and uh, basically they use a multi-thread, okay? That's make a selfish much faster than before. And, uh, and uh, so, but if you compare the, uh, all these algorithms, whatever the latest version, not necessarily the version reported in the paper, the latest version of all these algorithms, um, I would say the speed are comparable, right? Amazingly, um, it's uh, uh, in terms of the uh, rep uh, reproducibility of their result, um, it works in the following way. The results we, we get is always better than what they report in their paper. <laughs> so I know that everybody you know, always con continuously optimize their algorithm, right? So nowadays, all this, uh, you know, this group of algorithm, I would say that they have a comparable accuracy, comparable speed. It's not much different. It's actually it's various, like depend on the data you use, right? And one data set maybe one is slightly better than the other seems, right? But then on a different data set, then another one is the winner, right? It's not, I, I, well, if you talk to the individual authors, they may give you a different story, like. Uh, Something like okay, my my algorithm is the, is the best, right? So, and but uh, uh, our experience saying that actually there's no clear winner yet, right? It depends on which data you use, and then and then one algorithm may may um, do slightly better than another algorithm. So, which is uh, which is great. This is a still a, um, uh, actually an active field of research. If you have a better ideas. To, uh, uh, to speed it up, and then um, that's even better, or make it more accurate. Yeah, at least my students are working on that. We have some idea, not published yet, so maybe next year if you come back, then I can, I can talk about that one. So, um, 
um, because my, my student is currently a summer intern, so out of uh, reach. So means not responding to my email. So <laughs> I can't I can't get figure from <laughs> from the student. So I guess that's why because we can't keep them here because we we don't pay them enough in the summer. <laughs> uh, not not enough compared to like uh, Google, Facebook, right? <laughs> but anyway, so I'll stop here and I'll take questions. <laughs> <laughs>